Welcome back to Morning Coffee. It's the Joe and Lauren show. And we have a really interesting guest coming up right now. And we're, we're, without any, any hesitation, I'm going to call, I'm going to introduce him. And we're going to have, introduce our audience to this a very fascinating guy by the name of Mark Emery Boswell. And Mark is CEO and founder, National Action Task Force, Lighthouse Law Club, and MMG Capital Management. Mark, welcome to Morning Coffee. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Good. Well, let's 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 get started. Uh, you know, let's get at the National Action Task Force. What's it all about? Well, um, I think most of us are very well aware that uh, we have a problem in America, as well as many parts of the world, and that is that uh, um, our rights are being slowly dissipated and stepped on. Right, and that's happening largely because we, the people, are not well enough informed to know where to draw the line in the sand. So when someone uh, perhaps gives us some kind of order or mandate, uh, we just kind of roll over and say, oh, oh okay. And uh, that's just based out of ignorance of the law. Okay, so one of the primary functions of uh, National Action Task Force or NATF is to educate people uh, on how to protect and preserve their rights. Okay, where to draw the line and when to push back to say, no, uh, Mr. Public Servant, you have delegated authority. I, as, a, as a, a, a member of the people, am the authority. We are the law enforcement. The people are the ultimate source of the law, and we have to assume that position and start taking control of what some of our uh, errant public officials are doing. So that's that's it in a nutshell. How did you get involved in that, Mark? That's fascinating because you're, exactly, you're spot on in what you've been saying. How, how did you get involved with that? Well, it's uh, it goes back to the mid '90s. I was uh, in the insurance business then. I earned a really nice bonus, and um, the IRS decided they wanted to be my partner. And I thought to myself, well, you know what? I'm the one that worked for this, and uh, I think I deserve it. And so that started me studying the law. And the more I studied on uh, IRS issues, the more I realized that we were being deceived in many cases, okay? Yeah. The law is not what most people think it is. The law is what is being projected upon us. And so I started studying the law very intently. And that led to, uh, you know, from IRS issues, that led to, you know, the common things that we deal with, traffic, uh, tickets and uh, zoning infractions and you know all kinds of things and so so I began to kind of peel back the layers of the onion to find out that we all do have true freedom in the law if the law is honored and respected and that's one of the big problems we have today because it's not so so it's uh, it, it's a we're kind of in a quagmire but uh, yeah study of the law is kind of what brought me to all this so you're finding that there are discrepancies between what the law is and what our rights actually are, and that, that led you to form your organization to help educate people. Yeah, it's, it's more a matter of perception versus reality, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, many people perceive what the law is based on what we are told by others who want to control us or extract money from us. Okay. However, that narrative, uh, when you get right down to the letter of the law, is, is oftentimes not accurate. All right. So that's the discrepancy is what we believe and perceive versus what really is. So um, we believe, and obviously, in following the letter of the law, and we have freedom in the law. Uh, again, if only it's honored and respected. <clears throat> Can you go back to the example about the bonus and just say how that played out and what you did? Yeah, well, um, I was um, affiliated with uh, an educational organization at the time and, um, and started studying their materials. And basically what I did uh, as a result is, is I, I challenged the, the IRS based on the law simply by asking questions. You know, we don't have to fight. We don't have to argue anything. But 
when you are in a position where you know well enough what your position is, you can ask questions in such a way that you already know the answer, but you set the record in such a way that they cannot respond because if they responded honestly, they would say, okay, uh, here's your get out of jail free card. You, you're free to go. All right. But they obviously they don't do that. So, so they don't respond. And so you set the record in such a way that you're always acting in good faith, according to the law and um, a failure to object in law is fatal. All right, silence is consent. So, so you basically establish your position and you win by default. Okay, they have not rebutted your your uh, um, your claims and your position, and so therefore it stands. It's a prima facie evidence. You know, the record you know, is set, and you're good. You know, Mark. A lot of people get intimidated by the IRS. That's the big thing. You know, because I think it's an intimidation factor. That, that you're right, where the perception is different. I can't fight the IRS because they're they're big brother. They're the ones that are going to take care of me. I have no I have no recourse. How do you, how do you get over that? Well, ignorance or fear fear comes basically out of ignorance, right? Lack of understanding. Once you understand uh, what your position is, what the obligations of the people you're dealing with are, then that fear goes away. Okay. Uh, it, it's it's kind of like, um, <clears throat> you know, from the biblical perspective, if you've got faith, you shouldn't have any fear mm -hmm. because you know the power is within you, right? And when you know your position in the law, um, again, you, you don't have any fear because you know that you're on, you're, you're on top of the situation that A, again, you're always acting in good faith and you're, you're, you're asking uh, your, your counterparty to correct you if you're wrong. When they don't, um, you know, your, your matter is established. So fear comes from lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's our purpose is to create that knowledge in people so they don't have the fears. So we can then reassume our proper position in government as the source of the law. Mm -hmm. And the masters of our public servants who have delegated authority. They don't have authority. They have delegated authority from us. And you gave the example of traffic violations and um, taxes. Are those primarily the focuses of the education outreach of the organization? Not really a focus because there's so many things. Right now, we're dealing with, uh, you know, the main issue is, uh, you know, take, take the uh, vax or be fired. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the main issue for a lot of people right now. And uh, you can see what's going on uh, up north in Canada with the truckers convoy and that's spreading around the world. The entire narrative of this whole COVID hoax has been uh, is unraveling and people are starting to get a clue as to what's really going on. So that's, that's a, a real heavy uh, emphasis for us right now. Um, but of course, you know, uh, we deal on a daily basis with uh, tax issues and uh, uh, traffic issues, which is nothing more than a, a revenue scheme and has little to do with safety mm -hmm. in most cases. So, um, yeah, so it's uh, there's a number of issues, but yeah, right now, you know, the whole COVID thing is a, a big focus. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, Vax, because that is a real important issue right now. How do you think it's going to turn out? Well, I think uh, I think that the uh, the whole narrative, because it's based on on falsehoods, largely, uh, as I mentioned, it's unraveling, mm -hmm. and um, I, I think that truth is going to prevail. Truth always prevails. Uh, sooner or later, the truth comes out. People discover that, and they start acting accordingly. Mm -hmm. You know, um, again. We've all been subjugated with all of these restrictions and mandates and so on and so forth. Why? Because of blind fear. In fact, there was an article yesterday I saw that a Danish newspaper came out in a press release, a press conference, all right, and ad admitted that they had been pushing lies to the people. They apologized to their, their readership for not questioning 
the government position more than they have. And as a result, they were pushing lies. They came out and admitted it and apologized in public. And that, I think, is the beginning of a trend because people are starting to see the liability that they have for being involved in uh, basically uh, a genocide. Can it's we, serious. I just want to loop back to the sure. COVID thing. So I have a, a good friend who went through what you're talking about, where he was has been with his company for years, and he was the last person <clears throat> who hadn't gotten vaccinated in the organization. It's a big organization in, this, in New York. And they said, get it or leave. They, he, they were letting him work from home for a while, and that had worked out. And, but then ultimately, everybody went back to work, and they wouldn't let him come back. And they said, you have to either get the vaccine or you're terminated. What are, so he did. He got it, and he didn't want to get it. It caused him great, great amounts of anxiety, sleepless nights. He felt like his rights were being taken away, and he didn't want to give up his job. So um, what could he have done? Can you talk about what he could have done and what, what protections he has? Well, we start with, you know, fundamental human rights. You look at any charter, the UN Charter on Human Rights, the uh, U.S. Constitution, the Charter of Rights in Canada, any fundamental uh, charter of rights. And as human beings, nobody has the authority to tell us what to put in our bodies. Absolutely nobody, all right? So that's just absolutely fundamental. And these mandates are wrong from the beginning. But to answer your question, what could he have done? What we're doing in the uh, National Action Task Force is we've developed a, a claims process for damages. And it starts with a notice and demand, okay? It's just basic biblical law if someone is harming you or threatening to harm you you put them on notice okay this is where you're going wrong what you're asking is wrong and this is why and these are the laws that you're obligated to follow okay fundamental law and i'm asking you to cease and desist from this harmful activity uh, or there's going to be consequences First of all, the first consequence is you are going to harm me. And secondly, if you harm me, then that has a dollar value, okay? There's a price that's put on that harm. And if they, if they persist in harming you, okay, well now they, have, they, they, can't, they, can't, they can't claim uh, ignorance. Okay, oh, well, I didn't know. Oh, I was just doing what I told. No, they've been put on notice, so they have full knowledge. And they're now willingly, intentionally, and voluntarily harming you, which now brings in criminal aspects. Okay? So we've got civil and criminal uh, um, posture to put them on notice. You know, we don't want to start a fight, but we put them on notice. Cease and desist now or else. If you proceed, there's going to be consequences, okay? And this is what people need to be doing, is putting these, uh, these uh, uh, trespassers, trespassers on our rights, on notice, stop this, correct it, bring me back to whole, all right? Uh, uh, or there's going to be consequences because this is not allowed. Mark, let's move on, on to the Lighthouse Law Club. Could you address that for us? Yeah, well, that was an outgrowth of uh, my, my law study, uh, as I mentioned, you know, when I started with the IRS, because one thing led to another, and that led to another. And uh, I started talking to people, and I found that there were a lot of people that, that were concerned about how their rights were being violated, how how they were being, you know, stripped of their, their assets, their dignity, their freedom for, for what seems to be, you know, uh, victimless crimes, right? And so as, you know, that started gaining some momentum. And it's funny, as soon as you know one thing more than the next guy, they kind of put you up on a pedestal like you're the expert. <laughs> you only have a couple of little tidbits, but anyway, so that... So people started asking me more questions. What about this? What about that? So that forced me to do more research, and one thing led to another. We started the local group 
to uh, study these different issues and share what we're finding and uh, come together, uh, look for solutions and remedies. And uh, so we had a local group that was meeting on a regular basis uh, uh, back in the mid 90s. And then uh, uh, just recently, see, I, I now live out of the country uh, down in Panama. And so uh, having local meetings isn't uh, that conducive. So now with the, you know, the, the advent of Zoom and similar, similar platforms, we can we can really bring people in from all over to learn this. So so I started the Lighthouse Law Club as a venue for people to come together and learn, you know, a, a lot of these things and be a part of this community. So how many members do you have now? Oh, it's a small group. It's not uh, it's not large, uh, but we're we're a decentralized network, much like the NATF. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've got members uh, not only uh, throughout the United States, but also internationally. You know, there's a lot of interest coming from other countries, Australia, New Zealand, UK. So, um, you know, I don't generally talk about the numbers just for security purposes. Sure, sure. The one to attract too much attention, but it's a small group. And they'll reach out with challenges they're having and you'll guide them or, or let them know what their rights are? Yeah, we've got a library of resources, of research material, um, you know, sample letters, um, you know, approaches, discussions. And the beautiful thing about the Lighthouse Law Club is that it's really members helping members. You know, those who have experience in certain areas, they'll share with other members what their experience is because, you know, uh, certainly, I'm, I'm not a, a, an expert in all areas, perhaps in any area, but uh, I consider myself a traffic cop, just kind of steering people to the right resources and the right people. Uh, we've got kind of a, a very nice stable of specialists who work in certain areas that can help people. And uh, so that's kind of how it works. Well, that's so important to have experts in each, in each area, their own expertise, because then you're getting the best of the best. Yeah. You know, it's not one, uh, not one trick pony, so to speak. So that, I think it's a great idea, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, I wish more people would take advantage of it because we really need to, uh, again, establish our own authority and uh, uh, teach our public servants, you know, what their proper role is and where to draw the line. And at the end of the program, we're going to have, have you actually tell people how they can... Um, you know, I get more information about that at Lighthouse Law Club too, but let, let's move on to MMG Capital Management too. Uh, what 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 can you tell us about that? Well, again, that's that's another outgrowth. My background really has been in uh, international business and finance. You know, my dad put me in a business when I was 15 years old, selling parts to uh, uh, companies in uh, New Zealand. And so I, I started out then, my, I fell in love with international culture in my first French class in the fourth grade, and I've been involved in international stuff ever since then. I live abroad right now uh, in Panama, I've lived in several countries, and so I have, uh, you know, I've had a, a lifelong career path dealing in the realms of international business. So MMG Capital Management and Trust, um, again, is kind of an outgrowth of the Lighthouse Law Club. We specialize in... Uh, asset protection and financial privacy for those who can benefit from that. And um, it's, a, it's another means, you know, I often say that without privacy, you have no security, right? Mm -hmm. And we live today in the age of transparency. They want everybody to believe that, well, the, the correct thing to do is be 100% transparent. Well, you know, that doesn't work. Um, Again, you've got no security if you can't maintain a level of privacy. So otherwise you leave yourself wide open to all kinds of nefarious, uh, potentially nefarious uh, uh, attacks. So MMG Capital really uh, focuses on uh, asset protection, largely through dealing with uh, a very special type of uh, trust, different types of trusts. And we have a international financial infrastructure that, uh, uh, creates many opportunities to do some fantastic things in terms of developing an international portfolio uh, that's able to grow tax-free. Hmm. Totally, totally legit, but extremely private and virtually unassailable. So, 
so that that is as geared more for uh, for our uh, members who who have you know assets they want to protect and grow, leave a legacy for their family, and so on. Can you talk about how you protect the assets? Well, uh, largely through trusts, working through trustees, uh, working in multiple jurisdictions, working with our our knowledge of the law. And, uh, you know, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, it's not complicated. <laughs> it's pretty simple, really. It's just it's just a matter of repositioning yourself. See, most people have a great risk in the fact that their entire life, their home, their assets, their investments, their income, it's all in one jurisdiction. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you're you're rolling the dice that that one jurisdiction is going to be safe and manageable and operating under the rule of law um, so that you can, you can uh, maintain some stability. Well, I think we all can see that that stability is not there. And to have all your eggs in one basket in one jurisdiction is uh, perhaps not the best idea. So just like you spread risk and in investments through diversification, you also need to spread spread the risk of, uh, uh, you know, political calamity uh, and get out of, you know, one particular jurisdiction and, and, and spread that around as well. So it's a, an interesting concept. I, I find your whole concept interesting with, with all, these, all these three things coming together to protect people, maintain their privacy, not be frightened by big brother, so to speak. Uh, I think you're doing a fascinating job. Well, it's, uh, I don't know, it's where God has led me. Um, my, my whole life really experience has, has brought me to this position. And, you know, for a time you, you might look at it and say, wow, th this is really fragmented. You got this over here and that over there. But uh, at some point in time, I really realized that, hey, yeah, this all does really come together. And every single aspect of what I'm doing complements the other. And so it, it presents itself for a really nice, uh, really nice uh, assortment of, uh, of knowledge and experience and opportunities uh, serving really the same purpose, yeah. empowering people. That's the beauty of finding your path, having the passions come together harmoniously. Yeah, yeah, it really is and it really makes it for a you know, a satisfying experience when you can really help people out and see where they were before and see what you can do thereafter, you know, see the positive results. And the magic of Zoom means you can stay in touch with all of your members remotely. Yeah. Yeah, right now I'm sitting on a mountaintop in Panama out <laughs> in the hinterlands. And <laughs> wow. And I maintain my international operations uh, from here. It, it, it's so interesting because everybody talks about the pandemic being something that was so horrible, which it was. There's no question about that. But look at how look at how it's helped his business. It's so true. Because actually, yeah, I, didn't, I, yeah. I didn't hear that real well. Oh, I was going to say, like you know, everybody talked about the pandemic and all the all the you know, bad things that happened during the pandemic, all the all the, all the all the things that changed our lives entirely, which is true. But in your case, it's it's actually been able to. Um, to get people more involved because you can be think, doing things more remotely and using Zoom and tools like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you don't need the, really to travel. You know, I've had some people have kind of a knee-jerk reaction, you know, oh, all this international stuff. Oh, Mark, I don't want to travel with the pandemic. Uh, you don't have to travel, you know, one inch. We can do everything right from home, all right? There's, there's no travel necessary. So that's, that is that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's true because I think that people had to get a whole different mindset now about doing Zoom and, and, and remote learning and remote dealings with everything. So that was, that was, that was a, I think, a, a direct correlation to what happened with, this, with the pandemic. It might have gone that direction, but it might have taken longer. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And I like that this passion started when you, were, you said you were 15 and your dad threw you into selling parts, right? Do you think that yeah. gave you the experience of interacting with people and just saying, I'd like to connect with people in whatever I do? 
Yeah, you know, as a kid, I was I was painfully shy. I mean, to a fault. You know, I had a hard time even talking with adults, and so and naturally, I grew out of that. And now it's hard to shut me up sometimes. <laughs> but, <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 been an evolution, and uh, you know, I think it's it's evidence that uh, you know God has a plan for for each of us. And uh, it's important that we recognize what that is and embrace it and, uh, you know, make the best of it. Well, that's so great. That's Mark, a thing. Mark it's, been, it's been fascinating having you on, on our show. You, you, you're, you're a wealth of information, I'll tell you that, and things that I'm particularly interested in. I think our viewers are going to be very interested in contacting you again to talk about some of the things that everybody talks about, but nobody knows where to get the information. And so could you please tell um, my, all our viewers uh, where they can reach you and how, how they can call you and who should call you? Well, um, I'll give you the, the website for the Lighthouse Law Club. It's just kind of one central point. I've, I've got about a dozen different websites, so I don't want to confuse anybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but lighthouseliberty.club. And from there, you can use the contact page you know, to uh, drop me a message or a question, uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll get it from there. LighthouseLiberty.club, and uh, also LighthouseLaw.club uh, redirects to the same website. So either one. Mark Emery Braswell, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. I'm, I'm envious of your mountaintop out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, got a, I've got a background image that shows my view of the Pacific Ocean down below me. I didn't uh, want to make anybody jealous. Well, so. too late. <laughs> <laughs> too late. All right. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Mark, You're thank welcome. you so much. Have a great day there out in Panama. Take, All right. Will do. Take care. Well, that was very interesting. Yeah. And we're going to take a real, real quick break. We'll be right back.